I've given my message a title, not that I lacked in finding a better title, but this is the title I chose. What the Little Chicken Saw. I want to talk to you this morning about what the little chicken saw. And I know when I was at Oakwood studying ministry, Professor always said, always have a text because you're Bible preachers. So a text from which I have taken my title comes from the 50-50 division of the Psalms. The 50-50 division of the Psalms in verse 6, talking about what the little chicken saw. David said, and I said, oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then would I fly away and be at rest. Oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then would I fly away and be at rest. I think in my ministry with college students around the world, and from my own background as a college student at one time, I think I know some of the reading habits of young people. Some of our young people, many of our young people I would say, when they pick up the newspaper they immediately turn past the headlines and the feature stories. Some of them even turn rapidly past the fashion section, the travel section, the sports section, the classified section, who wants to work? And they jump immediately into that section that holds a lot of our interest after we've studied the Sabbath school lesson, the comic strips. Maybe you can recall with me this one particular comic strip that appeared one Sunday. It was a series of six pictures. The first picture the artist had was the picture of an egg. Huh? The second picture was that same egg cracked with a beak sticking through it. Huh? The third picture, the egg is not only cracked, but it's separated, and the little something within is standing out, looking around. Fourth picture, that little fowl looking to the left, looking to the right, fifth picture, looking to the rear, looking to the front, sixth picture. He's back inside the egg. <laughs> you got it? Now the artist sat down at his drawing board and he, he said, I'm going to get this message across to those who read this kind of material. The first picture. There was the egg, and it, the artist had drawn these squiggly lines around it, which said to me, something is inside that egg. And that, whatever it is inside of that egg is anxious to get out of it. Anxious to get out and be a part of my world, to see what's happening outside of his shell. And the second picture, the little something inside has struggled with all of its infant might, and has pushed and shoved and pecked, pecked away until finally the eggshell cracked and the beak and the head came through and he sat there <sighs> but still feeling the confinement of the shell around him he stretched his little bitty pardon me she stretched her little bitty wings took a deep breath and heaved and shoved and pushed and gave a great big thrust and the eggshell shattered and fourth picture third picture the little fowl standing there hi world here I am. Take a look at me. Are you ready for me? I've been anxious to get here. Finally, at long last, I have arrived. Clap your hands, world. Fourth picture. Look to the left. What? Look to the right. What? Sixth picture. Look behind. I can't believe it. Sixth, fourth, fifth picture. Look ahead. Sixth picture. Uh-uh, not me back inside the shell. What did the little chicken see? While in India, I had the privilege of visiting the orphanage 
run by Sister Teresa, a fantastic Christian lady who has spent all of her years in mission service in that country in the city of Calcutta, roaming the streets in the back alleys, the roads of the villages, seeking, picking little babies from the garbage, from the sewers, from the dung hills, where they had been placed left, discarded by their mothers. And as we visited the orphanage, we went inside one building and walked up a flight of stairs and the door was opened to us by one of the ladies who had been at one time found by Sister Teresa on the garbage dump as a baby. And she opened the door to us and she asked us to enter this room, which was a large room filled with baby cribs. And I couldn't believe my eyes when I looked and I saw in those cribs little things. Little, little, small. Where did these babies come from, we asked. And one girl said, like us, Pastor, we found them in the streets. We found some of them in the gutters. Some of them were covered with flies and maggots. Some of them we found on the dung hills, on the garbage heap. We brought them here. We've washed them. We've cleansed them. We, we, we've fed them. We're trying to bring them back. But every one of those babies I looked upon in those cribs were hovering between life and death, swing it as it was between the grave and shall I live. Little bellies, distended eyes out. Bodies emaciated. But one thing that that will always stay with me was as I look at those babies so many of them had gone back to the fetal position the position that they had held while inside their mother's bodies the position that they had held while inside enjoying the warmth and the comfort but all of a sudden they begin to pick up sounds from the outside they begin to feel the mother's motions made by her as she moved about and they begin to build up some anxiety that I've got to get out of here something exciting is out there something good can happen to me out there I am not going to stay confined within my mother all these my life I'm going to go out there where the action is I want to go where it's happening and on the ninth month the mother gave birth and then all of a sudden the little infant discovered, nobody loves me, nobody cares for me, nobody wants me. And as I looked into those cribs, into those staring eyes, and seeing those infants in the fetal position, it was as if they were saying to me, hey mister, can you help me? I thought it was going to be great coming into your world. I thought your world would be ready for me, but nobody loves me. I came here with a great deal of anticipation of the joys I was going to have of living in your great big world. I heard the sounds from within, but, but, but something has happened. Nobody cares for me. Please, mister, please. Can you send me back where I came from? My mom and dad... blessed to have eight children. We lived up on the East Coast in a city that is known in many parts of the world for its wickedness, its crime. And that section of the city that my brothers and sisters and mom and dad we lived in was a very unsafe place. But there was one thing about it. The apartment house that we lived in and the apartment that mom and dad made home for their eight children, which was just a two-bedroom place with a kitchen and a living room. But come nightfall, my brothers and sisters and myself could go to bed with a sense of security that helped us to sleep all night long. Even those nights when sounds from without would come into our bedroom and wake us up. But, but we had lived there so long that some of these sounds were familiar, so familiar to us to the point that they 
oh, they would wake us up, but they wouldn't disturb us, and we could go right back to sleep. Where and possibly if you had been visiting the night and heard some of those sounds, you would have you would have said, hey, man, somebody's trying to break into your apartment. Somebody's out there to rob us, to take our lives. But because the sounds were familiar to us, they didn't disturb us. I recall how the downstairs door from the street would open some nights and you'd hear soft voices down there mumbling, whispering. And a visitor in our home would have said, somebody's trying to break in here. Aren't you afraid? But it didn't disturb us because we knew it was the girl who lived downstairs returning home from her date and she and her boyfriend were saying good night in whispery tones. Some nights we'd be lying there in our beds fast asleep when we'd hear the steps creak, give way under the weight of somebody coming up, tiptoeing up those stairs. And then to get to the next floor, they had to walk through our hall and eventually, invariably, they would brush against our door, sound as if somebody were trying to break the door in. And, and people had been visiting us, they would have said, oh my God, what's happening here? But it didn't disturb us. We'd hear it. But it was not an unfamiliar sound. We knew it was the man upstairs, been out drinking most of the night with his buddies. He was trying to sneak in before Dawn and his wife got upset. In that little bedroom that we called ours, falling asleep, being fast asleep, some nights we'd hear a high screeching sound and scratching in the wall and running back and forth. It didn't scare us because we knew what it was. It was the rats trying to get in. They were familiar sounds. But all college students, there were some nights, and thank God they didn't come in regular secret, but there were some nights when man sounds would come from outside of our house, our apartment, that, that, that were unfamiliar to us and would scare us half to death. I mean, it was the kind of sound, young man, that caused you to sit straight up in bed in the darkness and look at your brothers around you and say, Did you hear that? Yeah, I heard it too. And then grabbing the covers back down in the bed, I praise God today for covers. There's something about covers, young people, that, that offer protection that you can't receive any place else. There's something about covers that can protect. I don't care what ghost comes out of that closet, what boogeyman materializes through the walls, covers can protect you. And we'd be under that cover, man, covered up from head to foot, and we'd be whispering to each other, you think you're still there? And then we'd hear Dad, and we'd be calling, Daddy! And boy, we could hear our father walking through the house, checking the doors, checking the windows, going to the girls' bedroom, checking to see if they were all right. Then he'd come by and flip the light on, you guys all right? Yes, sir. Okay, fellas, go to sleep. Yeah, it's easy for you to say. <laughs> We've been scared out of our socks, man. You talking about go to sleep. But we had been disturbed by a sound. An unfamiliar sound had come into our room from the outside and disturbed us to the point where it frightened us. What the little chicken saw. What was it that he saw? It made him withdraw into his shell. What was it those infants in India heard and saw that made them want to go back from wherever it was they came from? What was it? Could it be that, that little chicken, like so many college-age young people whom I've met on the various campuses of this church and secular universities, that they found themselves having been hatched against a backdrop of world tensions, that they have seen in this hate-filled world a desperate way of life, and with world events as predicted in Matthew chapter 24, have seen those world events stumbling over themselves in rapid su uh, succession. Could it be that in looking to the left, that little chicken probably was shocked by the sight of civilization, toying with degradation, flirting with doom and disaster, and that the sound, he had heard the sound of paradise having been turned into pandemonium by weak and puny men who are still in this late day of earth's history piddling with time. Could it be that in looking to the rear, that little chicken was disturbed by the sound of high-mindedness running the street like a mad dog 
speeding an uncertain path? Could it be that he saw pain and panic chasing each other like little children playing tag at recess time? Looking to the front, could that little chicken have seen the heat of selfishness causing the evaporation of the milk of human kindness? And hearing and seeing these sights and sounds, he felt, I can't cope with the situation. It's out of hand. It's too big for me to handle. And with that thought in mind, he withdrew into his shell. The little child, the infant said, please, mister, if you can, send me back where I came from. I wonder if this similar situation, a similar situation, could have been the reason for the, the, the psalmist writing this text. Here he was, God's man, handpicked by God to lead God's people. Here was a man from his early childhood who could remember having been led by God and having been empowered by God. Nothing out there frightened him. He's sitting on the hillside, strumming on his harp or throwing with stones with his slingshot, seeing a bear coming. No bear was too big to frighten him. Man, he knew that he had a power available to him. When the bear came to attack his daddy's sheep, he attacked the bear. When the lion came for his supper, he attacked the lion. Nothing frightened him until one day he looked off to his left and he saw that dark cloud on the horizon. It was threatening in its appearance, but he always thought, it won't come my way because I am who I am. One day he looked up and that cloud was not only coming near, hadn't drawn, not only closer, but had settled over his head. And a torrential downpour of horror and tragedy was let down upon his life to the point where he looked up in his son Absalom. His own son, old Absalom, the son whom he loved, had rebelled against the home, had rebelled against the government of the, of the tribe, had rebelled to the point where he ran off talking about, I'll come back one day, Daddy, and I'm going to fix you. That was an uncertain sound. Uncertain to the point where David felt himself withdrawing. And then the next sound he heard that really struck fear in his heart was some of his most trusted soldiers, some of his most trusted citizens were now leaving him and going over to the side of his son. Traitors as much, and so much so into their thing that they were even talking about, kill David. And the horror of it all was that uncertain sound that came about when news came to him in his seclusion. David, have you heard the latest? Those who have sung before, David, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his tens of thousands. They're now saying, kill David. We don't need him as our king. He's not worthy to lead us. We don't need such a person as he. Follow his son. His son will bring us the liberty and victory. And when David heard that in the 55th Psalm, it says it brought horror to him. The terrors of death fell upon him to the point where he backed up in this retreat like fortress and he cried out, Oh God! Oh God, if I only had wings like a dove! I don't like what I'm hearing. I don't like what I'm seeing. If I could just fly, Lord, if I could just fly, I'd be away from all of this stuff. How many times have I heard college-age young people say the same thing to me? They've asked the question, why, Elder? Why did we have to be born at a time like this? Why did I have to come into a world that is so beset with chaos and confusion? Why, Elder, with what's happening in the world today? Why, why? I'm disturbed by the sights. I'm disturbed by the sounds. Why would we have to be born? Why would we have to live? Why do we have to talk about Christianity at such a time as this? When everything is going haywire, when everything is about to blow up in our faces. Why, Elder? I know a lot of college students out there who are disturbed by the unfamiliar sights and sounds of this wicked and perverse generation. I know many of you seated here disturbed to come from your homes to this campus seeking a Christian education to be trained by dedicated Christian teachers to live the good life, to make preparation for the life to come, and in the meantime to exist in this life. I know. But at the same time, some of you sit here this morning and you're disturbed. Among other things, you're disturbed by this escalating inflation. 
You're disturbed by the increase of crime and violence that seems to go unchecked in our nation. Some of you sit out there this morning and you're disturbed by the breakdown of the home. Young lady came to me and she looked so bad and I said, what's the matter? She said, Elder Brown, would you believe? And after 31 years of marriage, my mother and father split up last night in this church. Some of you have gone through that. You sit here this morning disturbed by the elitist crowd in the White House who as millionaires are proving that they cannot govern in the interest of all people and disturb some of us. I know you're disturbed out there by the scraping of human rights for national interest. College students have talked to me about being disturbed by the talk of cutbacks to minority students and minority groups. I know you're disturbed out there by the freedom given to the hate groups who go about spitting out their vitriolic hatred of minorities all over the sidewalks of life. I know some of you are disturbed out there by the talk of the, this new MX warhead and the, the Defense Department's great increase in its budgets to develop this warhead that upon explosion will destroy all of human life and leave building and properties intact. I know that disturbs you. Some of you are disturbed by the sound how every ten babies born one dies within 12 months of life, dies a victim of disease, starvation, underdevelopment, poverty, and other preventable causes. I know it disturbs you. And I know I've found so many young people disturbed by what's happening in our society that they find life for themselves unbearable. I just can't cope, Elder. I, I don't know what to do about it. Again, we come back to the basic. Why did I have to be born at such a time as this? If God is all-knowing and all-understanding, if God has all power, why couldn't he prevent my having been born at a time like this? I want to get away from it all. And in their attempt to get away from it all, they discover they have no shell in which to withdraw they can't maintain the fetal position and climb back into their mother's bodies. They have no wings on which to fly. But all oh, we have some smart people on our campuses. If I can't fly into my own power, I know there are substances abounding that'll help me to fly. And you'll find Seventh-day Adventist college students flying on drugs. Caught up. High in the sky, as one young lady said, Elder, I know it's wrong. But listen, man, my life is hell. You don't know my parents. He is my father's an elder in the church. My mother sings in the choir. But the way they fight and fight among themselves, my, my, my whole life is a garbage dump, and I smoke this stuff because it takes me away to instant paradise. One young man tripping heavily on acid LSD. Man, don't you know it's wrong? Don't you know it's bad for you? I know all that. I'm not stupid, Elder. I've researched this stuff. But it helps me to get away. It takes me up. And I asked him on one of his trips, how high had you gotten? He said, I've been to the very throne room of God. Young people in this church, we know you have problems. You are people geared to the times. We know you have problems. We know you have problems. We know you have problems. Some of our young folk just don't know how to handle those problems. I find so many of our young people who smoke deliberately, drink, even overeat, sexualize promiscuously, fully aware of the harmful effects that these things and more have on their body and its central nervous system. But they do it in such a way that you ask them, hey, listen, don't you know better? Yes, we know better. But they do it in such a way, young people, as if the push is on, that they want to get rid of the whole swindle of the human experience. They want to get it over. They want to get it done with. And if anything that I can do to help me get over it, praise God, let me do it. And that's why suicide among young people college ages up in this country. The 
second highest killer of college students is suicide. And as one psychiatrist said recently in a study that he had done on several campuses of America, he said the reason for the highest amount of suicide, the highest percentage comes from those young people who have gotten caught up in the, in, in the sexual revolution. That is your body, you can do with it as you please. Nobody has to dictate to you, tell you. If it brings you pleasure, do it. If it makes you feel good, do it. And, and here you are, you're your own, you're away from home, you're at school, you can do it. And after they have done it following the whims of Satan, the guilt sets in. As one psychiatrist said in his study, it's the guilt of sexual promiscuity that's driving a lot of college-age young people to suicide. If I only had wings, if I could only withdraw, I've made such a mess of my life. And like the chicken, I'd like to get away. But I thank God that even though we are people geared for the times, we have an anchor. We must never ever forget it, we have an anchor. Things that are driving other students up the wall, things that are causing other people to jump off buildings and, 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 and to OD on drugs, the thing that keeps us is we have an anchor in Jesus Christ. We are the children of the coming King. And even though we live down here amidst the degradation and the sinfulness of these days, I thank God that even though I, my address is down the street, my home is in heaven. Even though I may be walking about and, and, and sin seems to overflow and to swamp the land, but thank God I'm not an earthbound person, I'm a heavenbound creature. And young people, you must never ever forget that. We're not chickens. We're not afraid of the future. We're not afraid of what the future holds. We know who holds the future, and that's what keeps us going. This school year, you're into the first month of it, I understand. Hardships await you. Trials are out there. People are on this campus whom you thought were Seventh-day Adventist Christians in every sense of the word. They're going to disappoint you this year. You're going to find kids on this campus like any other campus, smoking their dope and intersex. You're going to find it here. And if you're not careful in Jesus Christ, it's going to hurt you. You're going to find yourself wanting to hoist up the white flag of surrender. Am I different as one young lady said to me the other day on campus? What makes me think that I'm different? Elder Barron, until I heard you preach this morning, I had made up my mind I'm going to stop saying no to the guys on this campus when they ask for my body. I'm going to turn it over to them. I am no different from other girls. She said, but I listened to you this morning, and I've made up my mind. It ain't my body to give. It's God's body, and he died for it. And you hold on there, young ladies. You hang in there, you're Seventh-day Adventist Christians of the last order. You're members of God's last day church. You're not chicken. You don't have to throw away the standish young men. You don't have to bend under the pressure, young fellows. You can hold up because you're anchored on the rock, Jesus Christ. But the problem I'm discovering with young people in this church, the problem I'm discovering, ain't enough of us reading this book. The problem with so many of us, why we can sit in the dorm and cry the blues, why we can act all hurt because she quit me and he turned me down. I can't understand why God didn't send my money on time. The reason why we can do that because we are not in the book. You may be a people geared for the time, but you're no good to the times if you're not studying the word of God as it's written to you. And young folks, that's something we must get back to. That's reading the Bible. We've got to get back into the book, young people. If God's cause on this earth is to be a success, if it's going to be effective in our life and the lives of others who know not Jesus at this time, we must get back into the book. And if you don't get into the book, your life is going to be a sorry mess. You're going to end up like some chicken. Oh, if I had wings like a dove, or if I could just find a shell, if I could just fly somewhere, I could get away from it all. But you don't get away. That boy talking about on his acid trip, he went as high as the throne room of God, and when I saw him, he was riding in my car. Which says to me, the law of physics still holds true. What goes up must come down. Well, let me tell you something, young lady. You become anchored in the book, the Word of God. And let me tell you something, your soul will rise. 
Your soul will rise, your spirit will harbor, go up above the sights and sounds of this old world that would disturb you, that would bring fear to your heart. You get into this book and you'll discover for yourself that your God is your protection, that you don't need to run, you don't need to fret, you don't need to hide, you have no fear of the future because you know that God is with you, that God is in you, that God will keep you. And if you're going to have a good school year and make SMC, this year the campus that God has doing this to be, you've got to get into this book and put into practice what you read in this book. The promises of the Lord are sure. Get into the book and find the promise for yourself and lay claim to that promise. And like Jacob said when wrestling with the angel that night, God, I'm not going to let you go until you fulfill that promise in my life. And some of you need a promise right now. Some of you seated out here this morning up there in that balcony, you need a promise right now. You're hurting. Already, this early in the school year, some of you have already called home talking about, I'm, going, I'm coming home. Some of you are already so disappointed. You've made up your mind. I'm going to drop out as soon as I can. Some of you are hurting here this morning. But let me tell you something. You don't have to run home. Run to the book. And to the God of the book. It'll bring permanence and stability to your life. It'll keep you when all others fail you. It'll establish you when all others have disappointed you. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my path. When others walking around in this world that's grow, that's overcome with darkness, gross darkness to people, and you, they can't see their way, but thank God, because I'm in the book, it shines like a light. It shines like a lamp. It shows me where I'm going. It tells me how to get there. And it will help me to get there the right way. Read the book, young people. You don't know what you're missing when you don't. I was visiting in one penitentiary. And there was one inmate, an older man, caught my attention each time I would visit. I had 84 lifers I used to meet with on Wednesday nights. And this was the third worst penitentiary in this country. And I can remember sitting, but I'd watch him. He'd never sat down. He just walked. And finally, I said to one of the inmates who was doing a double life sentence, I said, hey, something, something, something about that fellow. He said, big preacher, don't let it wear you. But I couldn't help but watch him. And one thing that stood out with me, he had a bulge in his right pocket. And that bulge bothered me also. Because I know inmates in that joint, in that, in that penitentiary, were not able to carry too much. Because the officers knew they could take nothing and make something out of it to get out of there. And I said, uh, I'm bothered. What's, what's, what's in his pocket? He said, big preacher, why don't you talk to him? He was one of the best evangelists that this country had seen in a long time. But what in the world are you doing in here, man? He said, man, when I would stand up to preach, People came by the thousands to hear me. And finally, I got so good I didn't need the Bible. And when I put the Bible down, I stopped praying. And I lost my grip. And I'm in here now for the rest of my life. Extreme case, yes. But young people, eternal life is staring us in the face. Eternal death is beckoning to us. You have a decision to make. A people geared to the times. If you're not anchored to the book, the times will cause you to lose out on what God has gone to prepare for you. And it's not fair to him. It's not fair to your friends who are watching you. It's not fair to family who is back home praying for you. It's not fair to those who have sacrificed to get you here. It's not even fair to you. Last but not least, it's not fair to him who died on Calvary to make our being here possible. Young people, get into the book because you're not immune from these changing times. You're not immune from the violence and the disorder around you. You're not immune from the prejudices and the hate. You're not immune from the wickedness and the degradation. You're not immune from it. And the only way you can establish yourself, the only way you can be what God would have you to be, the only way you can have the preparation, the restoration of Jesus Christ's image in you, you've got to get back into the book. You must get back into the book. Take this book, young people, 
It's your road map through this maze of life into his soon coming kingdom. It's the picture of him revealed to you. And by beholding, we'll become changed. It, 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 it's what we need and what he has given us to satisfy our longings, to feed us. Man shall not live by bread alone. You can stay away from Mickey D's. You can stay away from the doggy diners. You can go to the book and be fed forevermore. It'll change your life. It'll help you develop character. It'll make you a better student. It'll make you a better child. It'll make you a better person. Get back into the book. And when you become anchored to the book, God says, I can do for you that which needs to be done to get you into his kingdom. This is no time. This is no time to be played in hide and seek. This is no time to be seeking wings to fly away. This is the time to fortify your mind with the truths of the book that will enable you to stand in the last conflict that is soon upon this church in the world. And let's face it, young people, through your studies, in the classroom, whether you pay attention or not, you know that this is God's last day church. You know within your heart that we are God's last day people and that the great delusions of Satan are soon upon us. You're aware of the fact that Satan is about to work his last great counterfeit that's going to deceive a lot of people into hell. You're aware of the fact that the very pillars of the truth upon which this church is built are under attack, not so much from outside, but from within. And young people, if you're not steeped in the truth of the book, when the pillars are attacking, you see them cracking, seeming as if they're going to crack and give way. You're going to run for fear of your life that the church is going to fall. And if you don't get out soon, it's going to crush you and take your life. But that's a lie. Yes, this church is under attack. But remember this, young people. Man did not build this church. God built this church. And whatever God builds, there's permanence to it. God said, I've designed this church in such a way that it will act as an impregnable fortress to my people who love me, who call me by their name, by my name, who have accepted my son as their savior, who believe in the crucifixion and the resurrection, who have faith in him to identify to the point that his life is now their life. He abides in them. They abide in him. And he's going to get us through. It's this church built by that God. Built in such a way that even though the gates of hell come and huff and puff against it, it shall not go down. The church will appear as if to fall, but thank God it will not fall. People of the times, but people of God, and that's what makes the difference. Stay in this church, young people. I don't care what you hear. The controversies are waging fast and furious. Somebody believes this. Somebody's teaching against that. You get into the book and find out for yourself what God wants you to do. They're questioning this. They're questioning that. They're saying this is no longer significant. That this is no longer... Hey, forget it, young people. Get into the book. One young man in one country said to me just recently, he said, Elder Baron, I'm so glad to see you. He said, I'm so confused. I said, confused about what? What do we stand for? I don't know. I'm so mixed up. I don't know what to do. I said, well, what do you think has brought about this confusion? He said, well, I'm listening to so-and-so's tapes and I'm, I'm reading so-and-so's papers. I said, man, there's your confusion. Try reading the Bible in the spirit of prophecy. Try reading, thus says the Lord, and see what it'll do for you. Get rid of the tapes. Get rid of the papers. And let God settle the issue with you. And young people, that's the problem. People of the times. And we're listening to people of the times. And all the time we ought to be listening to the God who rules in time. Get back into the book. Get back into the book. And I don't care who you are. I don't care what your problems are. I don't care what questions you have. I don't care what addictions. I don't care what habits. I don't care what your practice is. But you'll find the book according to Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. It's the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believes. It can straighten you up. It can pull you up. It can cleanse you up. It can sanctify you. It can make you holy. Get back into the book. 
And to those of you who have been reading the book and studying it regularly and daily with all diligence and you prayerfully consider its message and you openly beseech God to send angels down to instruct you and to teach you, I praise God for you. You continue doing it. And don't let the pressure of those who don't believe, don't let that pressure cause you to drop the book and mess up your life till you find yourself crying out, if I only had wings. God doesn't call chickens into his army who will run at the drop of a hat. He calls saints who are becoming saints for his kingdom as loyal soldiers in his army. And young people, if there's anything that SMC needs, if there's anything that this church needs, it's loyal soldiers in the army of God. Young people who fear not because God is with them, who will not bend to the pressures on campus and off campus because they know God is with them. Certainly you need a certain grade to pass the course, and you certainly you know within your heart you haven't given all diligence to study in that course to get the grade, and certainly you hear your friend's voice saying, come on, we can run, we can hide, how? I'll show you my paper, and I'll you sit in such a way you can see my paper, and together we'll cheat. You can look that foe in the eye and say, as much as I need the grade, I'm not running. Where do I meditate? David said day and night. I find it as a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And all I'm asking today, young people, is commit yourself to Jesus Christ and the study of his word. And I guarantee you, if you take it and set apart a time each day to read it, God will reveal himself to you. And when you put it down, you'll walk away with a strength you never knew possible. You'll walk away with a power that you never knew available to resist the devil so that he'll flee from you and you can maintain as a Christian on this campus, off this campus, wherever your lot may be. It's up to you. You have that decision to make. And I'm praying that God will give you clear vision God will give you the power to make the right decision that will outlast eternity. You can be with God forever. A day is coming, young people, and I'm not ashamed to preach about it. I believe in the second coming of Christ with all of my heart. I believe he's coming, and I believe he's coming soon, regardless of how soon, soon is, but I believe he's coming. And I preach today with the urgency I preached when I first became a preacher. And I believe today the way I believe when my mother first taught me. But let me tell you something, young people. It's gotten out of hand somewhere where, where it's not going to happen. It's not what the preachers try to make it to be. But let me tell you, a day is coming when he that shall come will come to redeem his people from the earth. A day is coming when a time of trouble is going to be such as the world has never seen. And only those will stick. Only those will stay by. Only those will handle the stuff are those who have found permanence for their life in the book. Those who have been anchored to the book. Those who have been implanted on the rock, Jesus Christ. Only those will outlast. Only those will endure. And only those will Jesus call. Come ye blessed of my Father. Inherit the kingdom I've prepared for you. Let me tell you something, young people. He's preparing a place especially for you. He's, a, he's preparing a place, yeah, for you too. Your name is on the door. The latch fits your hand. God says, I know what you're going through down there. I'm not asleep. I'm not, I'm not unconscious. I, I, I'm not insensitive to you. I know what you're doing, but hang in there. I'll get you through the school year. I'll get you through the semester. Hang in there. My truth will carry you through. Hang in there. I've got angels who excel in might and power to surround you and protect you from all the evil that Satan could heap upon you. Just stay in there. You don't need to fly. A day is coming when you won't need wings, but I'm going to take you away from it all. Just trust me. Let your faith be of such that you'll have confidence in me. Be confident of this one thing, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. He who started this good thing in you, he can bring it to fruition. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, we can do all things through Christ, which strengthens us, even resisting the devil in the name of Jesus Christ. What do you say, young people? We were known at one time as the people of the book. Let's get back to the book. Let's surrender our lives to Jesus. 
Let's turn ourselves completely into his hands. Let him control us and see how this school year ends up. He says in Malachi chapter 4, prove me. Prove me now herewith and see if I can't say, see if I can't do what I say I can do. Prove me. Go into the book and find the promise. You know your needs. You know your problems. You know the questions to which you're seeking answers. All right, get into the book and see if I can't do it for you. If I can't, you've got me. But let me tell you, I don't know of anybody in the world who can look at God this morning and say, gotcha. But looking at Calvary, I know God can look at me and say, gotcha. What about it, young lady? What about it, young man? Can you trust him? Will you try one more time to surrender your life? This is commitment weekend at SMC. Can we do have a public demonstration of commitment? I'm not talking about a mass movement of people. I'm talking about that college student you're reflecting now. Boy, this summer was a bummer. Somebody here this morning could be here hiding out. I don't know. Somebody here has tried to fly away from it all. I don't know. But maybe you'd like to just publicly come to the altar this morning with your heart open to Jesus saying, God, I'm sorry. Take me back. And let me tell you something right now from the get-go. He will receive you unto himself. He will in no wise cast you out. I don't care where you've been, what you've done. God says, come unto me, all ye, who have tried to fly on your own. Come to me. I'll give you whatever it is you need, beginning with forgiveness. Just come to me. Is there such a person in this auditorium this morning? You'd like to get out of your seat, whether you're in the balcony or on the main floor, and come down to the altar and recommit your life to Jesus Christ. Is there such a person? I wait for you. I wait for you. You know who you are. Can I get my pastors to come down on the floor and have these folks just stand facing the altar, open their hard doors, talk to Jesus? Would you come? Would you come? You played the chicken this summer. Probably even played the chicken last school year, acting like a little baby. But now you, by God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit in you, you're going to pull it together. Would you come? Would you come to recommit your life? Would you pastors come down on the floor, please? I know these young folk are coming for Jesus. Bless your heart. Just touch them for Jesus, brethren. Touch them for Jesus. Just come as you are. Just come as you are. Don't want to know what you've done or where you've been. Just thanking God that the Holy Spirit is still striving with you. Would you come? Saying all to Jesus, I surrender. Pastor Liv, say, go up and meet this young lady coming down. Brother PA, meet those young folk coming over that way. Bless your heart. Bless your heart. Bless your heart. While they're coming, I want to I wanna just swing it around, but those of you, as the Spirit moves, you're Seventh-day Adventist, Christian young people, but somehow or they got a little shaky. You played the part of the chicken. You looked out and was frightened by what you saw, but now you see God hasn't forsaken you. He's given you another chance. Just keep coming. But it could be there's a student on this campus who's not a baptized Christian, and you've been studying, you've been listening to our teachers, and you've felt the Spirit of God on this campus, and you know, you realize that I want to be a part of God's last day church. I want to join this family of his on earth. I want to become a seventh day Adventist born again in Jesus Christ. I'd like to have somebody study the Bible with me in preparation for baptism. Would you stand and come down and join this group? I invite you on behalf of the pastor, the officers of this church. Would you come? This is what SMC is all about. Claiming youth for Christ. Would you come? You know who you are. I call you in the name of Jesus this morning. Brother P.A., go meet those ladies, please. 
Gordon, would you go meet that young man coming down? Thank you. Don't let him walk alone. Let's walk with him. The remaining moments of this meeting, in the name of Jesus, I call you. Dump Satan from your lap. All he can do is fill you with fear and trembling and horror. But God says, I can fill you with love that fears nothing. And even though you're people of the time, I can keep you anchored. Just turn your life over to me. Would you come? Would you come? Pastor, go up the aisle and meet this lady. Will you come? Thank you, Wally. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Jesus. All to Jesus. All to Jesus. <laughs> and let me tell you something. I'm not stupid. I know it's not easy. I know it's not easy. <laughs> but you're doing it. And God hasn't left you to do it alone. Bless your heart. From way up in the balcony, they've come. Thank the Lord for you. I praise God for what he's doing here this morning. God bless you, sweetheart. You made it, man. Bless your heart. Take your time, folk. Take your time. Those of you who are out there and have a sweet connection with Jesus, I want you to pray. Don't bow your heads. Don't close your eyes. Just pray. I want you to see God work here this morning. But pray in your heart. You teachers out there, you've been carrying a special burden for a certain student. I want you to pray for that student with your eyes open. Let's see if God answered that prayer this morning. Let's see if he'll answer that prayer this morning. And if he chooses not to do so this morning, keep on praying for that student. Wally, there's a lady coming down center. Bless your heart. Bless your heart. Bless your heart. I praise God for you. I praise God for you. No chickens in this crowd. Not running for fear. No longer withdrawing. Going to Jesus. God bless you. pray now. I've been praying all the while, but I guess you can tell I can't. I love you. I want you to know God loves you too. He sees beyond the tears, fellas. He said, I cried. It's all right to cry. Standing here that your heart would break. Don't be ashamed. His heart literally broke to make your coming this morning possible. And you stand here this morning with a full assurance, I guarantee it, that this God of John 3.16 is standing very close to you right now. Very close. And he's going to do for you exactly as he says in John, 1 John 1, 9. Confess your sin. And you'll find him faithful and just to forgive you of those sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And then he says, I will let you become partakers of my divine nature. Of my divine nature. That will enable you through divine enablings to live the whole Christian life. But remember this, you are people geared to the times. 
which means the devil is going to renew his attack on your life. That rotten demon, that no... Let me tell you something. He's going to pull tricks out of his bag that you never thought existed to get you back from where you came from this morning. But remember this, young folk. Remember this. God says in 1 John chapter 2, I would that you never sin again. I want you to live the sinless life. But Satan is going to try to come and discourage you, cause you to slip and fall, and sin. Then he's going to say, you can't make it. I told you, you wasted your time. You can't make it. But remember this, the rest of the text. If you do sin, remember, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ our righteousness. And when you feel yourself going, cry out, oh God, have mercy on me. Please forgive me. And at that very instant, Jesus Christ, because of what he did for us on Calvary, will cry out to the Father, forgive him. Let my blood cover big mess up and then get up young man get up girl and by the power of God turn away from that sin and keep on trucking to the kingdom we can make it because God in us has made it there's a place up there for us and I don't want anybody inhabiting my place live the good life in Jesus and share the good news with others on this campus and when it comes to the issue, when it comes to the fork, don't chicken out. Stand like the brave with your face to the foe and resist him in the name of Jesus who died for you and made this whole day possible. You got that? Bless your heart. Bless your heart. Dr. Knittel, are you out here? I think it'd be very appropriate in this season of prayer if you and Pastor P.A. would come to the microphone. And I think, brethren, we ought to have a season of prayer. And Jim, I'm going to ask you to come on up and, as chaplain of this school, pray in my stead. Dr. Knittel, these are our young people. I know the four of us feel very close with these young youth directors down here on the floor. And I think, brother, we ought to just pray this morning. I'm going to ask you, Dr. Knittel, if you pray first, and we'll just follow in time, okay? Our Father in heaven, our hearts are touched this morning as we realize again our dependence upon thee, and especially the love that thou hast for each one of us. This love has brought us together here. This love has brought this group forward around this altar this hour. And your love will sustain them. Your love will comfort all of us, cause us to love one another. And Lord, we claim the promise that you will work miracles in our lives. And we pray for those miracles as we are here at this time in thy name. Amen.